find your park, your passion, your peace, your course. Find your path. Visit Cleveland Metro Parks and find adventure, inspiration, escape. Find what moves you, your forest, your happy place. Find your wild side, your fairway, your trail, your sunset. Well, I guess it depends on where you're joining us from, but good afternoon, Greater Cleveland. Good morning, the rest of us in Northeast Ohio and the Industrial Heartland. Welcome to the Industrial Heartland and Cleveland Trail Summit. Thank you for joining us here in Cleveland and virtually across the region. This combined conference is the product of powerful partnerships and synergies between the Greater Cleveland Trails and Greenways and the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition. So again, thank you all for joining us. Partnerships and regional connections are the themes that will reoccur throughout the summit and as we look at the many benefits that they can provide. And uh, now, uh, please let me introduce Andrea Ireland. Thank you, Derek. You will be joining experts, elected leaders, community developers, and trail professionals to discuss the impacts and opportunities the trails bring to unlock the economic potential of the region. We are so pleased to have you join us to be informed and inspired by engaging sessions, interactive breakout discussions, and networking opportunities. Now to further welcome us to the week ahead, our Ohio Lieutenant Governor Houston, Ohio Tourism Director Matt McLaren, West Virginia Tourism Commissioner Chelsea Ruby, and Cleveland Metro Parks CEO Brian Zimmerman. Welcome from the great state of Ohio. I'm John Husted, Ohio's Lieutenant Governor. Ohio is a place filled with resilient, hardworking, and caring people who have a deep sense of pride in our communities. While we wish we could be sitting in Cleveland right now, which was the original intention for the Industrial Heartland and Cleveland Trail Summit, rest assured that Ohio will be ready to welcome you the next time. This region has some of the best natural resources in the world and some of the most exciting ways to enjoy them. The vision of connecting the industrial heartland through a multi-use trail network is just the kind of bold action that makes this a special place. We are doers, taking on challenges that appear daunting and overcoming at times. Throughout this week of events, you're going to be introduced to the people, places, and bold ideas that reflect all the best aspects of our region. You will learn, you will be challenged, and you will be inspired to continue to make the industrial heartland the place to go to get things done. From Ohio to our friends in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and beyond, welcome. And I hope you have a great week at the summit. Welcome from the Welcome from Hi, I'm Matt McLaren, the State of Ohio's Tourism Director. Joy, happiness, excitement, Ohio find it here. And you can find what you've been looking for on the over 5,000 miles of nature trails in Ohio. Ohio trails have become extremely popular. This past year, Ohio's 75 free state parks and our Cuyahoga Valley National Park all saw record levels of attendance. Hikers, bikers, horseback riders, kayakers, and more travel to Ohio for its scenic beauty. Now we promote Ohio trails in the communities that they connect in our marketing through partnerships on our website, ohio.org, and in our co-op program, which includes cabins, restaurants, and retailers used by guests of Ohio's trails. We've also been promoting the new Detour Trails app created by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. The app has been a focus of our interviews, dedicated posts on our social media, and is available to download for free on the App Store or Google Play. The new Detour app gives you access to thousands of miles of Ohio trails, and from the app you can search for trails by region, level of difficulty, activity, and distance. The app also provides features, featured routes, provides driving directions to many trailheads, 
and includes trail manager information. Some of the most popular trails in Ohio are Ohio's Hocking Hills with its beautiful caves and waterfalls, the Great Miami Riverway with 99 miles of paved trail along the river, and the Buckeye Trail with 1,444 miles that wind around Ohio, reaching into each and every corner of the state. And we're seeing new trails being developed, like the new Bailey's Trail System in Appalachian, Ohio, where an additional 88 miles of trails are being built for all skill levels of cyclists, hikers, runners, and nature enthusiasts. Trails in Ohio, you can find it here. Hi everybody, I'm Chelsea Ruby, and I have the great honor and privilege of serving as the Tourism Secretary for the great state of West Virginia. Thank you all for joining today for this important conference. Um, there's been so much going on in the past year, but I think if one really positive thing came out of COVID, it's that so many people fell in love with the great outdoors. We saw folks getting out for the first time on bikes, kayaks, doing all the different things and enjoying all, their, all that we have in our region. So I think we have a tremendous opportunity. All eyes are on us. Everyone's suddenly looking to outdoor recreation saying, hey, this could be really important to the economies of our state. We've all known it for years, but now we've got so many people with us who are saying, let's see what we can do to grow our economies. So I just want you all to know that we are so supportive of this effort and any other effort going on in the state or the region to revitalize our trail system. You all know we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to work on accessibility, connectivity, signage, mapping. There's so many different things that we can do together. But I just want you to know that you always have a partner in West Virginia. If there's anything me or my team at the Tourism Office can do for you, know that we're here and we'll absolutely do it. So again, thank you so much for your time and all the work you're gonna do today. We'll see you soon. Come visit us soon in Almost Heaven, West Virginia. Hello and welcome to Cleveland. What an exciting year here in Northeast Ohio. We are excited to bring so many different trails to completion, and yet we still have work to do. This year brings the exciting grand opening of the Red Line Greenway, a dream of many from the Rotarians of Cleveland with the process of greening it up and called the rapid recovery process. We are so happy to open up this two mile section of trail to the residents of more than 67,000 different residents, eight distinct community little neighborhood areas, and allowing people to connect to our Cleveland Metro Parks. Not to be outdone by the Red Line Greenway, Whiskey Island Connector will be open here shortly, and the Wendy Park Bridge, the long-awaited Wendy Park Bridge, making that loop connection that is so desired by many. It is really fostering the relationship between reconnecting Cleveland. So many partners to thank that include the Cleveland Foundation, the Gunn Foundation, Ohio City Incorporated, West Creek Conservancy, City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, NOACA, private donors, and a host of many, many more. If I've forgotten you, I am truly sorry. When really talking about the Cleveland Trail Summit, so many different things come to mind. Projects that Cleveland Metro Parks has worked on for many years that include the Valley Parkway connector that most recently came to fruition, connecting the cities of North Royalton, Broadview Heights, and Brecksville. We couldn't be more happy about that 6.2 miles, really completing more than 34 miles from Detroit Road all the way to the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And what it connects to is one of the greatest resources, the towpath, more than 100 miles worth of connected trail here in Northeast Ohio. Again, welcome to the Trails Conference here in Cleveland. We are excited about what we're doing with the work in Cleveland, connecting our trails, working with so many different partners. We have more on tap that include East 9th Street to East 55th Street. We have so many different partners that are working on that. We've got connections on the east side that include connecting Morgana Run to Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation through the Washington Reservation, which is on the east side. And we look forward to bringing those projects to fruition in the coming years. So much to be thankful for and so much to look forward to here in Northeast Ohio. Welcome to Cleveland. Wow, absolutely amazing introductions. Can't thank each of you for uh, each of you enough for doing that. And as you can see, there are more and more people and organizations who are not only excited about the opportunities that trails and greenways 
uh, and these corridors offer, and they're encouraged to see us all come together to an advance outdoor recreation in the region. So my name is Derek Schaefer. I'm the executive director with West Creek Conservancy. With, uh, along with Big Creek Connects, we're one of the founding sponsors of the Greater Cleveland Trails and Greenways Conference in 2010. Our biennial event has gathered hundreds and uh, if not thousands of professionals and advocates, leaders, organizations to focus on trail and greenway development throughout Northeast Ohio. And it's, it's amazing that this partnership has extended into the industrial heartland as well. So uh, what, and what this also led to is the formation of the Cuyahoga Greenway Partners, bringing together regional leaders, local stakeholders and a coordinated approach to advance the implementation of trail and bikeway options throughout our great region. And it's now in a plan that has come to fruition is the Cuyahoga Greenways Plan. This is a, supposed to be a countywide network of off-road trails and on-road alternatives, low stress pedestrian and bicycle facilities accessible for all people, all ages, all abilities. It's a, it's a node of transportation, exercise, enjoyment. Uh, you know, it, each of our previous in, uh, folks that introduced, uh, there are so many projects to talk about in Greater Cleveland, whether it is the uh, opening of the Red Line Greenway and the Lynch Pin Connector, which will be the, the Irish Town Bend project along the Cuyahoga River, going over to Windy Park Connector and Whiskey Island. It's amazing that the Cuyahoga River Water Trail was recently named or designated a, a formal water trail, 93 plus miles of it. And then we get uh, named top urban kayaking spot in the United States and the completion of the towpath. And I mean, the laundry list could go on and on and on. But you know, these are just some of the resources that this summit is meant to bring together. And it's greatly appreciated. And, and if 2020 taught us, it did teach us something that it, our work together is pointedly important. Where did people go? They flocked to our natural places, our spaces, our trails, our greenways. And one of our sessions later today, will it'll look at the pandemic and how it did, it did inform new approaches to facility access, programming, design, operations, especially as we move forward. You know, we have a couple sessions, we have a session tomorrow that will really take a hard dive into community partners and how to create flexible and approachable engagement strategies to reach some of our most vulnerable or underserved residential populations uh, in an effort called CHEERS. If you're not from Cleveland, this is the Cleveland Harbor Eastern Embayment Resilience Study. Quite a mouthful, but it seeks to expand habitat, increase local resilience, and connect area residents to lakefront through access, equity, and create a resilient future for Greater Cleveland. And on Wednesday, we'll learn how the city of Euclid took an amazing concept to completion. It was a precedent-setting public-private partnership to create a three-quarter mile trail along the historically privatized property within the city of Euclid, the Euclid Waterfront. This, prop, this project is essentially changing waterfront public access throughout Northeast Ohio, and this is supposed to catalyze additional efforts throughout our great state. And on Thursday's session, we'll explore how partnerships and relationships and programs enhance connections and trails, creating physical linkage, linkages between the Cuyahoga Valley National Park and the many surrounding communities. At least to say, these sessions will capture challenges you know, and successes and benefits of building out this active transportation and recreational network within Greater Cleveland, Northeast Ohio. They're also in, in to look at it in a larger regional network of planned trails. And trails and greenways, they are, we, they are no longer ancillary benefits in our region. They are infrastructure. And we've come to realize that. And with all the partners you'll experience throughout this summit, you know, we're not only connecting people to places and people to the natural world, but also people to each other. And I'll again, hand it off to Andrea. And that's right, Derek. The Towpath Trail, which begins in Cleveland and winds through the National Park and beyond, the Cleveland and Euclid Lakefronts, and much, much more are relevant to a wide audience because they are part of the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition, a planned 1500 mile network of off-road multi-purpose trails that is already 50% complete. iHeart Trails, as we call it, the, is the other partner in the presentation of this summit. I'm Andrea Ireland, an outdoor recreation planner with the National Park Service, Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program. I am part of the project support team, providing assistance to the Pennsylvania Environmental Council and Rails to Trails Conservancies who are collaborating to lead and staff this regional trail effort. The Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition is a group of many organizations and stakeholders in the four state area of Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, and West Virginia. We meet quarterly to collaborate and advance the vision of the iHeart Trails. 
More than 100 agencies and organizations have participated in this coalition of trail supporters, which includes government, foundations, land managers, and railroad interests, all working together, actively planning and building trails to position trail development as a regional priority and create a destination trail network. You'll hear more about this in our first session in just a few minutes. Our sessions this week will also appeal to trail advocates from beyond Cleveland and the iHeart Trails footprint. There are lessons to be learned and shared by all. We'll take a look at Akron Civic Commons, an example of a really truly actively working with the community project which is leveraging millions of dollars to create accessible, equitable, and welcoming parks, trails, and public spaces along three miles of the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail in Akron, Ohio. On Wednesday, we'll continue our exploration of the iHeart Trails network as we travel northward on the towpath to hear about the history of the Towpath Trail's development in Cleveland, and how this trail has been used as a catalyst to launch additional major coordinated projects. Participants will learn how layering and coordinating these planning efforts over years and decades can be used to position projects to move forward as part of a system or network. And on Thursday, we'll take a look at the at trails and trail networks that are significant drivers of the outdoor economy and community development in West Virginia. These trails play a central role in, in an exciting new initiatives with a variety of partners, including universities and watershed organizations. On Friday, finally on Friday, we'll look at creating um, inclusive trails and outdoor spaces with Cleveland's own Leon Bibb to moderate. He'll wrap up our conference, our summit, where we will examine the barriers that prevent people from accessing and using trails, parks, and outdoor public spaces. This discussion with national thought leaders will explore excuse me, the lived experiences of people of color in the outdoors, as well as recent trends that explore barriers to trail use with a focus on race and gender, very relevant to today's topics. This will be a thought provoking and interactive discussion that will offer innovative ideas on how to create a more inclusive trail experience for all people. And now back to you, Derek. Well, at least to say that we're going to explore so many different types of community revitalization, entrepreneurship opportunities, waterfront access development, state and local leadership efforts, and so many other inspiring and groundbreaking projects throughout you know, greater Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, and the industrial heartland. Back to you. And we will do it through a dynamic uh, presentations of presenters, exciting sessions, engaging breakout discussions in a safe virtual way. Welcome to the Industrial Heartland and Cle Cleveland Trail Summit. Let's kick it off with a video from our first iHeart Trail session. The Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition is a remarkably ambitious project that is now over 50% complete. When completed, it'll cover more than 1,500 miles of trails. It'll run through 51 counties and four states. The return on investment is really significant, not just in terms of tourism dollars, but in terms of quality of life for our citizens and in terms of making our community a place where families and businesses want to locate. Thank you, Kent. This week, we will be, will be about unpacking the vision of the industrial heartland 
and exploring what it will take to unlock its potential. This will capture the special places that make outdoor recreation possible. You will hear familiar faces and new trailblazers as we look at the potential of the region in context of this plan to complete the 1500 mile trail network and through the themes of entrepreneurship, leadership, community development, tourism and community connections. Let's start with the role of trails in building entrepreneurship. Businesses need customers. So when you develop trails and a community around it evolves into something that's more walkable, hopefully more shops open and restaurants and coffee shops and the community then evolves into a destination. I think the key thing is to think of the rail trail, it's almost like a mall, like the old mall that would have the core, the big stable business and others would build out around it. We've been doing nothing but reading case studies of other cities and how uh, the trail has impacted their city and you're going to see more shops, pop-up, restaurants, eateries, etc. and possibly even a hotel. We've been trying to get a hotel in downtown East Liverpool and if we were to, able to establish this trail well then I think that'd be a no-brainer for some of the hotels to come here. The bike trail really is a destination so a lot of people from New York City, a lot of people from DC, um, from Cleveland, you see them coming here to enjoy the trails. I can say it definitely benefits us having this, the, the trail traffic. Smart business people recognize if I associate my, myself with a trail system, I can enhance my overall marketing, which is so cool. Craft breweries are relocating either in a town along a trail system or midway between. They didn't do that by happenstance. It's really all about economic development and travel and tourism working hand in hand. We talk about economic development as bringing new businesses, recruiting and retaining talent. One of the things we found in our study is that the properties along the trail itself, the values grew at like three times the rate of the broader county. We're a block from the trail, right? And that trail is along the river and Pittsburgh has run an amazing job with trails and bike lanes and all that. And so we're on the new Greenway, so we're right beside the Greenway, right in the road, right where we are right in the heart of the Strip District. The Strip District's booming. Getting a trail connected from the lake to the river would be absolutely amazing for this area, for the entire region, the entire trail. It certainly spurs the economic development there, but it also makes the cities much more livable. I mean, people want to live near a trail. I mean, what a great thing to have. At the end of the day, you take your dog for a walk, or you walk with your friends, or you take a ride, or you just de-stress, right, back out in nature. A lot of manufacturing jobs have left the area, and now they get attracted by the trail and see how beautiful and great this area is. And we do hear people moving here and telling us the story. It's pretty cool. When we were talking with um, business owners and advocates and others, they said, yes, the, the, the trail supports our business. You know, it's good for our employees. What we kept hearing, though, is this quality of life, these social impacts that maybe aren't anticipated but are vital. We're an aging population here, and we need to, to start attracting young people uh, that have graduated back here and, and, and people to stay here. Uh, and that's been my biggest concern for, for our local businesses is how do they attract and retain uh, good employees and, you know, the city plays a crucial role in, in that and quality of life, the amenities we have to offer and the, the trail is crucial to, to help tell the business's story to get them to stay and live here as well. What a great video setting the stage for our discussion today. Welcome everyone, my name's Kathy McCollum. It was my honor to actually participate in one of the first Trail Town programs. And as this session's about entrepreneurship, I'm delighted to be able to also introduce you to our two presenters today and ask them a few questions to kind of get to the meat of it. So Shay Strait, um, Shay's the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Fairmont. He's responsible for all of the comprehensive planning, zoning, and all the community engagement in that city. And he also is uh, looking at connecting it with trails. And we also have with us, Caitlin Lusk. Caitlin is the program coordinator for the Cambria County Conservation and Recreation Authority. She also communicates very frequently with the small businesses in town, which is perfect for this discussion today about trail town businesses. 
So we know that there's a lot of positive economic impact realized by trails coming into small communities and that businesses are springing up. But Shay, one of the first questions asked to me, asked of me by potential entrepreneurs was, what about the winter months? I mean, this is a kind of a good weather kind of market. So what do I do as a small entre entrepreneur start launching a business? What do I do in the winter? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And of course, the foremost is great financial planning and making sure that you uh, have a plan for your business to sustain the highs and lows with that. That comes naturally. But on top of that, the other thing you could look at is the diversification of your business and making sure you're hitting on as many available demographics as possible and contributing back to your local microeconomy. For instance, if you're a local bike shop, maybe it also could be the local sports apparel store or other types of things to help fill the needs of your local community. As well, um, you know, trails, I think, can be all seasonal, especially if you advocate well and maybe even carry the right products for them uh, to help keep the users out there and engaged. But definitely looking at those different ways that you can entice uh, folks um, with different uh, sales and services and to keep that diverse as possible. And, and Caitlin, for you, I'd like to ask a lot of the trails enter a community at the edge of the community, not all or in the middle of the central business district. So if you've encouraged a small trail business to open and market to that user group, how do you ensure that the market, the cyclist gets to the business? Well, it's very important to make sure that they have safe ways to get there. So we are actually currently working with some of our local community communities along one of our trails in particular that passes through um, two different counties to see if we can get some kind of signage up there, um, greenways along the roads. Um, we make sure that our maps are very detailed as well. That's very important to make sure that your trail users know where to go. And it's also important to make sure that you're touching base with all the businesses that would potentially attract your trail users. Say you have a restaurant maybe a mile off the trail, we actually do have a campground that is about half a mile from one part of our trail. So we try to make it clear how you can access that and we cross promote for one another, just so again, trail users know it's there, how to access it. Excellent, excellent. As community leaders, and this question will go to both of you, but we just have a couple minutes. Uh, but as community leaders, how do you really start the conversation with entrepreneurs? How do you reach out to that entrepreneurial network and begin this discussion of coming into your town and opening a business? Shay, I'll pitch it to you first. I think communities can definitely be proactive in this and talk about how there's a need, there's an economic need in their community to to begin wanting that engagement and bring those folks to the table, potentially uh, new businesses as well. I think it's a great way to handle that. And Caitlin? Yep, I agree completely. And um, whenever you have new businesses coming in, it's definitely a cooperative effort. There are needs that the trail itself has, there are needs that the business will have. So it's really important to be creative and proactive on finding ways that you guys can find some common ground. Um, whether it be partnering with events. Um, as a trail organizer, we host a lot of um, fundraising events, packet pickups at a lot of these local businesses. We've even done scavenger hunts where the winners of them can go to the business for a coupon or a free item. But um, it's, it's just essentially making sure that you're promoting one another and showing your support, making it public because whenever the trail users see that the trail organizers support a business and they know about a business, they're more likely to go and do that as well. Um, trail towns, uh, our trails are often loca located next to several communities. Do you work with your neighboring towns on any sort of activities or promotions? We, we absolutely do, yes. Um, we manage three trails in Cambria County and um, just one in particular, the Ghost Town Trail We've done several different, different events. Aside from our trail series, again, we've done the scavenger hunt on that trail for the 25th anniversary two years ago. Participants, they would find a rock on the back, they would get their coupon. It's a great way to create that foot traffic. We worked with a local brewery as well to um, encourage people to go there. They named a beer after the Ghost Town Trail. It's actually called Rusted Rail at the Ghost Town Trail where we would get a percentage of the proceeds back so again, we would encourage people, hey, you're visiting the trail, stop by and grab a beer because it supports us. So it's also helping people learn about that new business that just came in a couple of years ago. 
And um, again, we've had fundraising dinners at a lot of these businesses. We've organized bike rides where we provide the transportation. They ride down the trail to a destination and there's a concert there at a local business. So there are a lot of ways that you can get creative with it. Again, it's just about finding their needs and interests and how you can work together. Wonderful. I think we've all learned a lot from this panel and thank you both for participating. Best of luck in your various communities. And I still need to get out on that ghost town trail. So hope to see you soon, Caitlin. Shay, always a pleasure. And I've been to Fairmont. Hope to get there again. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Hey, Kathy, Shay, and Caitlin. It's such exciting opportunities for new and existing businesses to capture the many benefits that trails can provide. And of course, all trails lead to beer or ice cream, depending on where you are. Next, we'll hear from elected officials who would, of course, want to capture the many benefits that trails offer for their communities. How it's evolved over time was when the big industry was here, big industry left, it's shown its natural beauty again with the rolling hills, the beautiful forest, the bald eagle population growing, the trails, the waterways, the wildlife activities you can be part of, quality of life out of your back door is something that's gonna be the next wave of the future. We are working hard to make sure Euclid is a vibrant community welcoming to all, uh, a great place to live, work, and visit. There's a huge amount of pride that goes with our trail network. People will say, kind of like, before the trail was here and after the trail was here. People will um, use this for transportation, they'll use it for recreation. The East Liverpool trail front really goes beyond economic development, obviously that's a huge part of what we're trying to do here, but it ties back into that quality of life, the lifestyle that we would like to see our residents the ability to have. The Greenway Trail has always been important to the village. I think, however, we're starting to realize just how important it can be. I want to make sure that more people recognize that this is about everybody. It's where you can go from home, ride your bike to the trail, and if you decide to get off and walk, you could walk through a neighborhood, to a neighborhood, past a neighborhood, and everybody would be involved. What we as leaders need to do is show, hey, there are economic benefits. If we boost the trail, this is gonna create jobs. And those new jobs will be paying taxes, which will be used to improve public services. We're hearing great things from businesses and residents. I think they're really excited about the new energy that they're seeing here, the new vibrancy. My advice to any city leader, just open the, those lines of communication, whether it's to other mayors in the county uh, or the, the county officials and state, even at the, at the state level. What went well with their trail? What could we learn from them and how could we do it better? The motivation to connect our community to the waterfront really came from the residents. Uh, so the beauty of our plan is that it was citizen-led, that we started by going to the community, asking them what they wanted, um, and built the plan from that. The role of elected officials really was uh, to provide the vision, to provide the funding, really to keep this project going. Part of what we could be doing as legislators is making sure that we're making those connections through our state agencies to the, the, to the trails. So as a council member uh, here in the village of Yellow Springs and also the Midwest policy manager for Rails to Trails Conservancy, the messages from this video around political will and collaboration between elected officials and constituents uh, really resonates. And that's why I'm excited that we have a council member, Jenny Celine, who was, you met in the video from Morgantown, West Virginia, and Jenny, I wondered if you might share a little bit more about how vital the trail network has been for your community and region. Uh, so we took something, so I've lived here for 30 years. Um, we took something that was, and, and I did not participate in the beginning, my husband did a little bit, but um, we took something that 30 years ago was useless, semi-industrial old sort of waste property and brought it back into use. So, and brought all of the adjacent property back into use. So that's 
pretty amazing when you can get an asset. I would say that that what what it's transformed into is something that um, people treat it like a main street. Um, mm. It's a social space. It's an economic space. Our amphitheater is along it. Um, we have now three uh, kayak launches on the river that's adjacent, and it's just it makes it so that there's a 300 person kayaking club. They don't all go out at once, thank goodness, but uh, it's, 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 just, it's just made it into something very, very special and something that's useful. And otherwise it just wasn't. Now there's a remote worker program at the university and they had thousands and thousands of people applying for a few slots to uh, be able to come here and participate. It's, it's, I don't know of any other thing that's happened in our community that's made such a huge difference, that's made such a transformation. That is so amazing to hear. And I've been able to visit your community several times, you know, really delivering on that trails build healthy, thriving communities. Uh, so we also have Representative Kent Smith here, uh, who is always one of my favorite folks to have on a panel. And, um, you know, speaking of political will, uh, Rep. Smith, it'd be great if you could share with uh, folks the Ohio Legislative Trails Caucus and, and what that means for our state. Hi, Brian. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for having me. So, yeah, the, the Ohio Trails Caucus was founded in 2017 by a Democratic senator and a Republican senator. Uh, they do deserve a shout out. That would be Steve Wilson and Sean O'Brien. Um, currently, there's uh, 18 Democrats, 19 Republicans, but I mean, we've been able to do uh, several things in Ohio as a result of that. Uh, we created, uh, we worked with a whole collection of trail advocates um, uh, with uh, some of our state departments and um, facilitated, you know, public comment and created, um, I think we got 7,600 public comments on this issue on this topic, uh, but we were able to create a, a 2019 document uh, over 150, about 150 pages by o our Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the Ohio Trails Vision, uh, which uh, it works to help guide uh, future trail development, connectivity, maintenance, and funding, and kind of all the important things um, that uh, can help, you know, further the great trail system that we have in Ohio. All right, well, thank you, Rep Smith. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of one of the other th great things the caucus has done with the bipartisan collaboration. And I know you've been on a couple of our adventures on the trails where uh, Republicans and Democrats have walked side by side and, and really trying to deliver on that Ohio vision that you talked about. So. A question for both of you uh, that I think will be good to go out on is, how do you think uh, citizens, constituents can best work with their elected officials to make meaningful progress, to you know, move things forward, like completing the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition and a variety of other aspects? What are your recommendations for stakeholders? Who do you want to go first? <laughs> Go for it, Jenny. We'll start local. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things when you're talking about uh, events where people are looking at this lovely asset together, looking at where a trail might be, looking at where a new bridge is, um, inviting uh, leaders who may not have been uh, included before to the opening of a little connector bridge to a neighborhood. Um, these are assets that everyone is for. Maybe somebody, when you're first planning uh, planning an area to be connected or to be used, they may be concerned that something's going to happen that's unfamiliar. But once you have it in place, it is just, I mean, people get very, very excited. And politicians love <laughs> developed assets, things people can use, connected neighborhoods to business districts, places where people can play. Uh, a transportation asset so someone can commute. So it's something where we should be able to work together. Now that's a should. <laughs> so we need to work on developing those partnerships and relationships, keeping people updated back and forth, political people with people who are helping to write the grants, 
people who are writing grants explaining that they're going to need some kind of a um, matching matching funds and and how to use those state dollars. We can pass it right off to you. All right. And Rep Smith. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I, I think that, um, you know, uh, elected officials need to be re need to be reminded that um, healthy communities have healthy economies. And, you know, just the, the economic development asset and the community development asset that the expanding trails can provide. Um, of course, you know, you folks at the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition are aware of some of the pieces of research that have been done on the economic impact, like the $7 million annual impact of the 24 mile Three Rivers Heritage Trail in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm very, I was very happy to hear that you all are going to do a, a bit of a deeper dive on the Euclid Lakefront Trail, which is really kind of a first of its, uh, of its kind development. I live in Euclid and have seen this development stall and stall and stall and then when Mayor Kirsten Holsheimer Gale, who was featured in that video, uh, came into office, she was really uh, the galvanizing force to try to get people to trade uh, public, private, uh, private owners of property along the lake to trade public access for erosion control because erosion control was becoming so significant as the Great Lakes rose. But um, and that's now a best practice. And, you know, I, again, Wednesday, you all are going to do a deeper dive on it. But I mean, you know, I would be reminded that, uh, I mean, the outdoor, the, this was an industry report, but the outdoor recreation industry suggested that, you know, outdoor recreation is, you know, like an $800 billion industry in sports, $7 million, uh, 7 uh, million jobs across the U.S. And again, what we want to do in uh, the states represented here is make sure that our trail asset is capitalized on and is maintained and grows. Because again, as I said, you know, kind of at the beginning, um, healthy communities have healthy economies. Thank you, Rep Smith, great words. Thank you, council member uh, Celine and Andrea, we're gonna pass it back to you. Thank you, Brian, Jenny and Representative <laughs> Smith. It's good to hear from those elected leaders who can advocate for and make decisions to include trails. These decisions are key to community, important community development that we'll take a look at next. To transform a community, uh, you have to have things that everyone can enjoy. And a trail is just that. It is something everyone can use and benefit in their own way. What we call a community environment, that it helps people know that there are, are ways for them to be connected to the, um, to the parks and to the trails. And that to me is, a, is part of what people are looking for when they talk about uh, quality of life. The overall goal is to bring more people to our region's greatest natural asset, which is Lake Erie, and open up the awareness and access to this incredible asset that we have here. The greater connection of our waterfront trail to other trails really will bring Euclid new visitors, new energy, and new sense of pride from our residents. Uh, we're really hopeful that we see, continue to see what's already started with new investment in new housing, with recreational activities, and really just a rejuvenation of a city. We are the lakefront city and it is gorgeous. And so when I think about the limitless possibilities, restaurants, pop-up shops, vendors, street performers, that's my vision for this area here. I just want to see families getting out and getting together, spending time together and enjoying this great mother <laughs> earth that we have for as long as we're gonna have it. As we started reconfiguring our attention and communities to the, to the rivers as assets and trails that went alongside those assets, we recognize that these become sort of like veins and arteries in the community. People get from one place to the other. They also get their relaxation. 
uh, get their exercise, they meet their friends, it's a gathering place. Cycling is a sense of community and so you, you have a nod of the head or wave the hand or meeting up with the people in the community, the neighbors and patronizing their businesses and to be quite frank, exposing people in some neighborhoods who may have not seen African Americans cycling. Um, as a matter of fact, we had a road ride the other day and it was like, yay, black people cycling. <laughs> like, yeah, we do cycle. <laughs> Our business is all about community. It, it's, it's all about community building. It's about you know sharing our passion for running, riding, just life. And on that, when we ride through Homewood or an African American neighborhood, and we're ringing our bells, people are hollering at us and waving at us. So I think when they see us and then they see the healthy ride bikes, maybe that'll push them to say, I want to ride a bike. Good afternoon. So I'm a complete community development nerd. And that video was a lot of fun for me to, to watch. I'm Kent Spellman. Uh, I've been working as a consultant for the Rails to Trails Conservancy, mostly in Northern West Virginia, uh, closing gaps in rail trails and helping communities take advantage of the rail trail assets that they have. Uh, with me is Amanda Pitzer, who is the executive director of the Friends of the Cheat. Friends of the Cheat is also the driver behind the Mountaineer Trail Network Re Recreation Authority, which is being formed. And Kim Harris, who is the project manager and outdoor recreation specialist for the Oil Region Alliance. As I watch that, I realize that really the greatest tool we have for economic development is successful community development. I loved what Mary Hunt said about trails being the veins and arteries of our communities. Uh, so what we're trying to do with trails is help create communities that offer outdoor recreation amenities, that welcome diversity, and that support small businesses. I've been working on rail trails since 1988. That'll tell you something right there. But um, what I've learned over those more than 30 years is this. I love trails, but I can tell you it's not about the trail. It's about what the trail can do for your community. So with that, I wanna sort of turn it over to Amanda and let her talk a little bit about what she thinks um, her organization is doing in terms of looking at trail town capacity and why that's an investment they're trying to make. Thanks, Kent. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that I grew up on Lake Erie. I, I grew up in Erie. So watching the videos have been really great and great to see all the wonderful work happening up there. Um, but now I'm a river rat. As Kent mentioned, I, I work for an organization that is place-based and uh, we have spent many years uh, working to, to keep our water quality uh, good and clean. And now we have people flocking back to the river and uh, in addition our trails and, and working to build uh, trail amenities around the river. And it has been maybe different than some of the processes that other folks go, go through where maybe the trails happen first. Um, you know, the river was here and we ended up here. And as a result of that, we have uh, really worked to build community around that vein, around that artery that flows through um, our towns through our through our backyards and in turn now we're looking to couple trail development with that not only in our region but across uh, the 15 county uh, region here in in uh, northern West Virginia um, and as Kent said it's not about the trails you know I, I tell folks a lot we're not building a trail in the woods thinking it's going to change the community um, we're building the community and that's what's gonna change things are the individuals that are gonna use that trail and engage with that trail and uh, build their lives around it. Thanks, Amanda. Kim, talk to me a little bit about what your work involves in terms of connecting trail development with the community work that you're doing in your region. Sure. Um, well, our trails in the region, for the most part, are part of the Erie to Pittsburgh Trail, which is part of the Industrial Heartland Trail Coalition. Um, so the Oil Region Alliance um, that I work for, we administer the Oil Region National Heritage Area. Um, and with that, what we've seen, like Amanda, our river was always there. We had the rail corridors our, um, that would haul the oils and such out of our region, but that all went away. 
went away. Um, some people would say that wasn't good, but some of us that like the outdoor natures would beg to differ with that. It gave us the opportunity. So it was um, back in 2013 or 20, that's what's 1998, was the first trail that was actually laid within the region. Um, and from that, um, a vision to do a wider connection outside our region was um, developed. But to maintain and take care of these trails, it takes a community. So the communities are adopting the trails and they're helping our trail groups by just being out there and monitoring to make sure everything's okay, taking care of trees that are down. I mean, things happen um, and we'll get a report, there's a tree down and before someone can get out there, it's, it's taken care of because the community has embraced that. Um, the Oil Region Alliance to help spur on a lot of that, um, probably about eight years ago, we kicked off a um, trail contest, a business contest, and it's for new businesses wanting to get started or it's to help a business who's already there, but maybe they want to expand to help on the businesses. Um, so we operate that each year and we're finding just some really new and unique ideas are starting to flourish out of that, but it is connecting the trails and that to the communities. The commu if the communities aren't there, there's no reason to have these trails. Absolutely I mean, right. Yeah, yes. that's, that's really the, the most important point is that the connection between trails and communities doesn't happen by itself. It has right. to be done intentionally. The community mm -hmm. has to be engaged and the community has to really try to put itself on the trail in one way or another through signage or through access. So right. these are all great lessons. And thank you to the two of you, um, uh, Amanda and Kim, um, just for everybody to know, these short videos and these brief conversations are teasers. And we hope that you will participate in the sessions throughout the rest of the week um, that will deal, dive more deeply into all of the issues that we're seeing this afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Amanda and Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Kent, Amanda, and Kim. It, it is what your trail can do for your community and how your community embraces it. But then others see that experience and they want part of it. They want to come from either locally, regionally, or further. And that is the basis for expanded tourism related to trails, which is what we'll talk about next. It's not hard to see that uh, bringing a trail into a community uh, changes that community. We're seeing people reconnect with the riverfronts in the ways that they haven't done in probably a hundred years, and then also capitalizing on the river recreation uh, tourism that they can also have. In the past, we had steel, we had ceramics, we had coal. We had to reinvent ourselves, and tourism is one industry that we should really be examining. Our vision is to make Lisbon a tourism destination building upon the Greenway Trail. I often hear people talking about uh, seeing Pittsburgh from the river and what a different, unique perspective that gives them. So if we're able to utilize a trail system in a tourism perspective and bring that business and bring those residents to a community, that really is a golden moment that I think that we all really need to embrace. The Three Rivers Heritage Trail system has seen an increased usage of tourism over the years, especially with the expansion of us connecting into larger regional trail systems like the Great Allegheny Passage, like the Erie to Pittsburgh, like the Industrial Heartlands, like the Great American Rail Trail. Well, right now we have a 300 mile continuous trail and uh, I can only imagine what it would mean if that was extended to 1500 miles. Uh, we already see people from all over the world uh, coming here to, to experience this trail. If we bring more people in and those people spend more money, inevitably that's going to create jobs and that's going to boost our tax revenue, helping us to improve public services. Whereas maybe tourism comes and goes, it ebbs and flows with the season and with the you know, broader economy, with pandemics and all kinds of stuff that could happen. I think one of the, the biggest long-term impacts is that good, stable, ongoing, property value, taxes that will continue to support a county and a city. The excitement the trail brings to the city is just driving people to the city and being able to show what we have to offer here and obviously bringing the city back to prosperity. We recognize that trails are truly an economic driver and they're critically important. 
they can bring people into um, a business community or an industrial park to think about relocating their business there. They can also be utilized for residential communities. Economic development is what sort of spawned the, the trail system in Pittsburgh as well as the Great Allegheny Passage and it's, it, it's coming to fruition now after, after all these years and uh, businesses like mine can easily survive and exist around a trail system like this. So I mean the idea is once this trail is completed from the Ashtabula down to East Liverpool, I just think, expect an even greater influx of people coming to Lisbon, which is great for our businesses and for the downtown. Outdoor recreation to me is a magnet and it is a magnet for experiences that span a lifetime and that's what a trail system can do. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Camp of Cycle Forward and it's my pleasure to introduce Ann Nemanik who is the executive director of Go Laurel Highlands and Melinda Huntley, who is the executive director of the Ohio Travel Association. Um, I know that we're all eager to hear from two of our most respected tourism professionals in the region. And so let's just jump right in. Uh, Melinda, I once heard you say, people will come where they've been invited, made to feel welcome, and they're asked to return. What are a few tangible things that trail communities can do to get visiting trail users into town? Thank you, Amy, and welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, you know what, I think I, I heard Ann say this in the video about the experience. And I want you to kind of think about trails as almost a linear attraction. Understanding it's not just about a transportation route, but the entire experience of a trail is essential, which means it's about getting people to your community, but we also have to recognize that each peace is only as strong as all the parts. So each community needs to be able to, you know, really be engaged with that trail. So if I were to say, you know, what could be done, work with the other communities on the trail, because a visitor is going to be attracted by a more unified story, unified approach, and they're going to have the expectation that the experience along this, this linear somewhat attraction um, is they're going to be evaluating that as a whole, not just necessarily in individual parts. Oh, that's wonderful. So there's a mindset shift there on the part of communities. And what would you add? I would give a couple specifics, uh, Amy, if I could. I love flowers. You know, it, it could be as simple as planting a beautiful flower bed as an entrance into um, your city or your community with a nice welcome sign. Uh, I know one community along the Great Allegheny Passage actually has uh, individuals during the summertime that dressed up in period costume and they're bell ringers. And they do that because there's a bridge that connects over uh, to their community. And, and in order to get them into town, it's a way for them to um, it kind of have something a little unusual, uh, a way to greet them and a way to welcome them into their own community. And, and I really do agree that education is key. Um, hold an educational session. Let people know exactly what's going on, even as the trail's being built, so they can feel that they are part of the process. And then when everything is pulled together and all those connections are made, then they are a true cheerleader for what it is um, that you want to promote. Yeah, great, great, good advice. Um, so this next question is specific to how we accommodate cyclists. Uh, some research suggests that most people are looking for casual trail experiences. Um, you might consider it to be soft adventure. Um, how do you reconcile this with knowing that those who do multi-day rides are responsible for a disproportionate amount of spending? Um, where do we place our energy? I can start with that one. It's such a great question and I'm so glad uh, that you asked it. I think we have to remember that research shows what is, not what is possible, right? So it shows us what is, what not necessarily what is possible. Multi-day rides in, include overnights. And so that's why there's increased spending. We know that once, when someone spends a night, they're in the communities longer, plus they have that overnight stay. And we also know that many casual users are, you know, really nearby trail users. So I think we need to look at this less as 
you know, the soft adventure versus the hard adventure and really focus in on, you know, what are your goals for reaching people maybe 50 miles or more away? Um, Because I'm going to go out and I'm going to say the casual users that may come from 50 miles away or more um, really probably spend more time and more money in your local shops, your restaurants, your breweries, uh, than maybe that avid multi-day user who is there for the ride itself. I know I'm a casual user. My dad's an avid. I stop at every, you know, store or, you know, community along the way. He's there for that trail experience. I think one of the things that we really need to think about doing and, and advice for using energy is can we start creating packaged trail experiences for some of these casual users? They want the adventure. We need to make it easy for them. And can we link it to lodging? Can we link it to some of the different attractions? And understanding the casual travelers and their needs. So how are they going to get their bikes from point A to back to their car? Or how are they going to ship packages? Um, There are so many possibilities with with developing packages for this market that I just, I'm I'm super excited about it. And I think we can have more conversations. Yeah, yeah, great. And what, what would you add to that? It's pretty simple, Amy. Um, my, my answer is money is money. Um, I've operated in travel and tourism for over 30 years, and it really didn't matter where that $20 bill was coming from. Um, you have to realize the importance, I think, of the locals, um, because they are the ones that help to spread the word. Uh, your day trippers, as, as we have said, spend a lot more money and um, they will frequent the trail a lot more perhaps than just your through riders that are there just to get from one point to the other point very, very quickly. So um, your, your local folks and your local residents and your day trippers, they're your social butterflies. They're the ones that are gonna help you promote your trail. Mm-hmm. Great, okay, so we have about a minute left. Um, so I wanted to introduce some tough love to this conversation. Um, what can community advocates and trail advocates do to be better tourism partners? My answer is easy, you share the wealth. Um, I think in order for a trail system to be successful, everyone needs to work together and they need to share in that success. Um, If one community doesn't have something, maybe the next one does. Um, Mm -hmm. If they all have coffee shops, how are they connecting that use of coffee in each of their own communities? And again, I go back to education is key. You Mm -hmm. absolutely have to make sure everyone is listening and a part of the process. Yeah, good. Melinda, you get the final word here. Ah, so first of all, I would say remove the tough from the tough love. It is about love. It is about how do we work together? Um, and and I love how Ann said, um, you know, educate. You know, I also said, listen, right? So it, it's about collaboration and work with local CVBs and DMOs. And then how do we listen to one another? How do we meet each other and have common goals? And, and it is truly about loving our communities, and loving what we do. Ann and Melinda, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, Melinda, and Ann. It's so exciting and inspiring to see uh, what's possible as trails help others, other people to feel welcome, increase tourism opportunities, and to experience your own community or the community of others. And now we're gonna look at uh, how some of this is playing out on the ground, how trails and open space are impacting communities. The Akron Civic Commons is such a project and let's see why. Summit Lake a few years ago, I will honestly say depressing. Dull. Abused and neglected. People talked about how polluted the water was. There was one bench in this park That bench did not even face the lake. I didn't want to move over here, but it changed. When Civic Commons first came down here, I was not the least bit interested. It kind of gave me a different perception and actually hear them say, we want to know what the residents want. 
as opposed to coming in and saying, this is what we're gonna do. Civic Commons came to this community and realized they had to earn the trust of the community. We have to break this legacy of things being done to and not with, and things promised and not delivered. All we're really doing is trying to bring back and revive that sense of pride and play. We didn't realize what was hidden behind the bushes until Civic Commons came. We realized we were all in tandem. We all had the same goals. We just wanted to make a better space for everyone. And we added seats, shading, lights. You can't know more than the people who live here. I see more children out playing in the neighborhood. Families feel more safe with their kids being able to come down here. But you just see more people, and that's really refreshing. Come on down for a guided canoe trip. Come on down for a s'mores party. Give us the opportunity to introduce you to the neighborhood residents, because I think once you actually spend time in the space, I think you actually might start to change your mind about it. Partnering with residents to co-create what that rebirth looks like and needs to be can actually be a catalyst for a wider community development. At the neighborhood level, you can't get anything done without trust. It's embedded in the process to be inclusive. The invitation has to be something that we give often, and not just to residents, but people outside of the community. This is the Civic Commons process. Civic Commons really does define how you build trust. We're changing the world. We're doing that one neighbor and one neighborhood at a time. Now, it's a place of community. It's a place of friendship. It makes me proud to be able to say, this is Summit Lake. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Rice. I'm president and CEO of the Ohio and Kanawha Coalition, and it's my honor and privilege to be along with Mr. James Hardy and Grace Hudson uh, to share a really exciting update about the Acro Civic Commons process, which is right along the Ohio and Canal towpath trail, right in the heart, in the center, right in downtown Akron. So with me this afternoon, um, I have two of our great partners, um, Ms. Grace Hudson. Grace is a Summit Lake resident and Akron Civic Commons Fellow and the Chair of the Summit Lake Community Development Corporation, and also James Hardy, Deputy Mayor, the Office of Integrated Development. So welcome, thank you both very much for joining us. We're really blessed and fortunate because uh, the reason why this project works is because of our residents as well as the city of Akron, because it gave us the permissiveness to do this. But as both of you as longtime residents and leaders in Akron, can you please just kind of share your impressions and memories of Summit Lake and then your impressions of the Akron Civic Commons process, because I know both of you have a lot of, of uh, long time experience in this community. Grace? Um, well, like you said, I'm a, I'm a Summit Lake uh, resident. I live right on the lake and I spent and still do when I can, uh, walking my dog every day along the towpath. Um, and and as the video said, it was, a, it was overgrown. You couldn't really see the lake and it's this treasure sitting right here in your backyard that you couldn't see, you couldn't access, get to it. Uh, there was nowhere to sit to enjoy it. Um, so when Civic Commons first came along, I was kind of curious, just I'm nosy. I wanted to know, okay, what is this about and what are they gonna do? So I kind of, um, got involved and listened and, and um, Dan did a good job of working. He understood that he had to come in and build trust. Um, so, and that was done and through a lot of community meetings, um, everybody got a voice, even the children got a voice. Um, so today as a result, uh, there's a space for people to use and people are using the space. Um, there's, there's birthday parties, there's graduation parties, there's family reunions. Um, actually, we were down there last week in the evening for another meeting and there was a birthday party. And um, I actually watched the mother at the end walk around and pick up trash. So, um, 
the space has brought back a sense of pride to this community and, and people really enjoy using it and they are using it. Thank you so much, Grace. James? Yeah, I, just to build off what Grace said, I think growing up in Akron, Summit Lake, uh, apart from where I used to play baseball, there was the only baseball field with lights was in Summit Lake. Um, and I think that's a good analogy because when the lights broke, they weren't fixed. And I think to what you saw in the video and what Grace just described, Summit Lake has really been, um, unfortunately, a poster child for municipal and public sector disinvestment over the past 30 to 40 years and, and, its, um, and its people. And so I think what Civic Commons really, to me, has done is laid a platform upon which we can re-engage in the community from a public sector perspective, atone for sins and also learn. We need to relearn. I mean, I still have staff that were a part of some of those decisions. And so how do they show up now? How are we changing as an organization? And it's definitely a work in progress. And so, um, you know, the, the, the park itself, now that we're, we've gone from no investment to now we're talking about a 12 plus million dollar park. But beyond that, we now are talking about infill housing, we're talking about economic opportunity, like it, it's it sparked a whole conversation that before Civic Commons was not happening. Yeah, th thank you so much. And uh, I know we only got a few minutes left here. Um, so if, if there's a pearls of wisdom that we can share with folks out there who really want to, you know, develop those relationships, what would be the advice that, that, that you would share? I mean, what we've learned over the past five years, Grace, what would be the kind of the the, the keys that you'd like to share with people? Um, I think it is very, very important to uh, build trust, yeah. um, be transparent mm -hmm. and be honest and then sit back and listen to <laughs> what the residents have to say. Yeah. So James, you get the last word there, my friend. Um, uh, for me, it's about showing up. I mean, I, I think that people in, in my job or in a planning director position or economic development director position or even yours, Dan, in terms of being a convener around the conversation of trails and parkland, you have to be present. So many times, and Grace knows this, I get called on in public meetings, not necessarily because I did the thing to the community, but I am representing the organization that did the thing to the community. And so we have to be there uh, in person to work through that if we're going to build trust. So I think showing up is a really important thing. You cannot farm out uh, to a certain extent. You can't farm out the engagement. You got to build your own relationships. Absolutely. And just to kind of wrap it up, I mean, I first of all, I want to applaud both of you because you, you're you incredibly visionary leaders and you you both took a risk. And I think that's really also important to, to underscore. In fact, you need to be vulnerable and also own the relationship because um, we've had a lot of hard conversations. Um, trust is earned one project at a time, one action at a time. We're still earning it. Um, but we would not be here today if it wasn't for Grace Hudson, James Hardy, and many, 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 many other Summit Lake residents. So thank you very much. Um, but more to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, James, and Grace. Such a a great project that's happening there at Akron Civic Commons. I hope you have enjoyed that quick trip around the industrial heartland. We are looking forward to a deeper dive in those sessions uh, throughout the rest of this week. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to everybody who participated today. We are looking forward to the rest of the week. Please look at your chat and you will see the agenda and the rest of the summit will uh, come back to you at 2.30. We look forward to seeing you all all week long.